please. Okay. I joined in March the 17th, 1943. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Probably as much for just wanting a uniform like everybody else as uh, for any highly patriotic ideas, I joined the Marine Corps. They called me the Marine Corps Reserve. Uh, they only allowed you to go in the reserve at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, they called me for active duty on the 21st of May, 1943. And I went to San Diego to go to recruit training. Eight weeks of recruit training. And when I got out of the recruit training, they sent me to communication school where I learned to string telephone lines, operate switchboards, repair those equipments and so on. After eight weeks, of training in communication school, they sent me out to Camp Pendleton, California to uh, get a little infantry training because up to that time the only weapon that I ever touched was the M1 rifle and they wanted me to know how to throw a grenade, how to operate a machine gun, etc. So I get, was trained in that at Camp Pendleton. From there, I went overseas to Honolulu and was put in, in what they call a replacement battalion. Now, a replacement battalion had virtually no structure. It was just a bunch of people thrown together and uh, they were to go overseas to some depot somewhere and then combat outfits was to draw from this replacement battalion. The replacement battalion was at a place called Camp Catlin, right on the outskirts of uh, Honolulu. Sometime in November 1943, I was moved from the replacement battalion to an infantry regiment on Maui. The 22nd Marine Infantry Regiment. In January of 1944, the re regiment was called on to be in reserve for the invasion of uh, invasion of Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands. They always had a certain amount of reserve in case the outfit that was attacking got shot up too bad. Oh, we didn't do anything at Kwajalein. All we did was cruise up and down waiting to see if somebody needed us. When they didn't, the Battle of Kwajalein was over, they sent us out to invade Inuitok. In the Inuitok Atoll, we invaded three islands, the regiment did. I was at two of the islands, an island called Njibi and an island called Parry. A third island, the island of, the main island of Inuitok, was re uh, invaded by our third battalion and some army elements. After that, they sent us to Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands, which the battle had been over there for a long time. We were just to use it for a training base and a home to rest up in between actions. We were there from probably around the 1st of April, 44, until June of 44. So during, during these uh, islands that you participated in the invasion, there, there was resistance on these two islands? What's that? There was resistance on the islands in oh, the yeah. invasions? Oh, yes. Can we talk um, about that a little bit? The reason that they took them was um, 
Admiral Nimitz came up with a, what he called a stepping stone mm -hmm. theory. <coughs> MacArthur had tried to come up through New Guinea and so on, and it was a literally a stalemate. Mm -hmm. So Nimitz said, we can take a stepping stones. And when we get far close enough to Japan, we can then bomb them. So Inu we talk well not not the first one the first step was in the Gilbert Islands at a place called Tarawa which I had nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. The second step was Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands. Okay. The third step was Inu we talk. Now uh, they, for him to get to a place where he could bomb Japan he needed one more step. So in June of 1944, his, step, his next stepping stone, the one that he could use to bomb Japan from, was the Mar uh, Marianas Islands mm -hmm. of um, Saipan, Tinian, Rhoda, and Guam. Again, we played the same game that we had at... Uh, Kwajalein. We were floating reserve for the Saipan Tinian fighting and again not committed. And so they sent us in to invade Guam. The big significance of Guam was not only that it was within bomber range of Japan, but it was the first American territory to be taken by. Guam had been an American possession before the war. Mm -hmm. Another bad part of it, or a bad part of it, was we were landed in the wrong spot. My section leader, a fellow named Bob Strader, and I got in a hole probably made by a bomb, and our platoon officer came in with us and we were looking at maps trying to figure out where we were supposed to be and the platoon leader was killed sitting right between us. We went ahead and took Guam and went back to Guadalcanal for more, tra for more training and rest and in the first day of April 1945, we invaded, we had been built up to a division by that time. We had the 22nd Regiment, the outfit I was in, the 4th Marines, which were the old Raider Battalions, named the 4th because the 4th was the one that was caught at Bataan, and this new outfit was named in their honor and a boot outfit from the States, the 29th, made us into the 6th Marine Division. And we invaded Okinawa. After we had taken Okinawa, which took about 80 days, because mm -hmm. um, it was a big, it's a big island. Yes. Uh, we went, we were figured we were going to go back to Guadalcanal, but Guadalcanal is down close to Australia, and by that time it was too far out of the war picture, so they sent us back to the island which we had captured, Guam, to use for a training base. We went back to Guam, and while we were there, the war was over. So how long were you on Okinawa? Oh, about the 80 days. Okay. Uh, we went back to Guam and were using it for a training base to invade the Japanese home islands, which Okinawa is so close that that would have had to have been the last. Mm -hmm. uh, the atom bomb was dropped. Myself, I'm grateful the bomb was dropped 
because I had had four invasions under my belt. Two islands in the Inuitok Atoll, Guam, and Okinawa. I think my luck was running out mm -hmm. by that time. But I didn't come home yet. Somebody, I don't know who, decided that we should go out to China to ensure that the Japanese in northern China did indeed surrender. Because mm -hmm. there were many people in Japan that didn't want to surrender. Uh, we went to a, a place in China called Tsingtao. And the, the Japanese did surrender at a big surrender ceremony on, on a racetrack. And uh, they surrendered and very shortly thereafter I came back to the States. Mm -hmm. It was a process for discharge at my Mare Island Naval Base in San Francisco and was sent home. My family were lumberjacks by trade. Where was home? Hmm? Where was home? Klamath Falls, Oregon, in so southern Oregon. I went home and uh, because I had been only 17 when I went in the service and I had worked in the lumber camps two summers while I was in high school, I went back into the lumber business. It dawned on me very shortly that I didn't want to be a lumberjack, although my uncles, my father had been that all their life. Uh, well, about that time, electronics was just getting started. Mm -hmm. So I saw, started seeing this ad in the paper that if you take this test as a civilian and pass it, that the Navy would send you to 44 weeks electronics school. All you had to do after that was choose whether you wanted to go surface Navy or aviation. I chose aviation. Mm -hmm. I took the test, passed it. All I had to do was choose whether I wanted to go surface or aviation. So I chose aviation for a couple reasons. First of all, when I was in the slogging infantry, I'd seen these airplanes go over and while they might be in some danger, at least they went to a warm bed and warm meal at night. In the infantry, we didn't get that. We got a hole in the ground and a can of sea ricings. So I requested aviation. They sent me to Corpus Christi, Texas, to a small island out in, in the no, I'm familiar. Hmm? I'm familiar with Corpus Christi. I've been reading... Well, it's a small island mm -hmm. out in the middle of the water between uh, the city and, and, and the naval airfield called Ward Island. Mm -hmm. I got a picture of it that I took off from internet just the other day. And for, for some reason, one of the economy reasons, I suppose, I'd got in about the eighth week of this 44-week school, and they closed the base mm -hmm. and sent us to Memphis, where I finished the school. Uh, when I finished the school, they sent me to San Diego for assignment, and I was, sci was uh, assigned to Commats. Asiatic in Honolulu. Uh, Com Mats Asiatic Mats was transport squadron. Mm -hmm. So I headed for Honolulu again. I got to Honolulu and it seemed that they played the trickle down process. 
whoever was the junior man got sent the furthest, and I ended up on Guam again. Very disheartened, because I was going to have to stay there 18 months, mm -hmm. and I was still, this was 1948 by then, I was still only 23, not quite 23 years old. Mm -hmm. But one day, I hadn't been there two weeks, and one day they said that for all of us to assemble at the outdoor movie. We got there and they said, we're going to Germany. The Russians have blockaded Berlin and we're going to fly over it. But we're only going to take volunteers the amount of people, or we're only going to take volunteers first. We're only going to take the amount of people that we can put in our own airplanes. We'll get more airplanes when we land in uh, Moffett Field in San Diego, California. So I went over to Europe, and at that time, I, the electronic technician was not a flying rate. We uh, repaired the equipment and re repaired trouble on the aircraft. So I spent from early November 1948 till August of 1949 in Rhein-Main, Germany with a squadron was flying over the Russian blockade. Mm -hmm. What sort of planes were you, huh? what, what sort of aircraft were you working on at the oh, time? Oh, at that time we were flying C-54s. Oh, transports, right, okay. Uh, yeah, the Navy called them R-5Ds, mm -hmm. but they're C-54s, or actually DC-3s, I okay. think. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in about August or September of 1948, they brought us back to the States. No, that would have been, by that time, I'm losing it a little bit. I went in in 47 to, to Germany in 48. No, so this is 49 okay. by this time. They brought us back to the States to Patuxent River, Maryland, and just as a holding point, they didn't know where, where they were going to use us. Every day a new rumor would come in. We were going to Gulfport, Mississippi, or we were going here or going there. Finally one day, some guy came in the barracks and said, pack your ditty bag. You're going to Westoverfield, Massachusetts mm -hmm. to fly the northern to Europe and North Africa route. So we went up there, and there's where I became an air crewman. The aviation radioman was flying in the aircraft for no other purpose than to tap a Morse code key. He didn't know anything about radar, mm -hmm. so they picked seven of us and sent us to a school in Anacosta, Maryland, military school, where they taught us how to operate and maintain a, a radar. They then, I guess simultaneously to us being in training, they installed radar in our aircraft, mm -hmm. and they designated the seven of us as being radar navigators, and that's where I started flying. I stayed in Westover until January of 1952, where I uh, transferred from there to Memphis, Tennessee at the Navy schools to be an instructor. I instructed radar from 1952 till 1955. 
1955, it was a three-year tour. They had established tours set up. I, not only my tour was up in 1950, I, oh, let's back up a moment. In 1952, I got married to a mar marvelous lady. In 1955, I was due for transfer. I had mm -hmm. completed my tour on instructor duty, and they transferred me to get this airships, blimps in a place called Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Our function was to make sure that no one identified uh, Russian submarines got in close enough to the uh -huh. east coast of the mm -hmm. United States to do damage. So we're doing sub patrol up and down the mm -hmm. coast. Now was there any thought Huh? Was there any thought that the Russians were coming? Huh? Did anybody really think that the Russians were coming? They were there. Mm -hmm. They were there. Okay. Uh, that they were belligerent at that time, who knows? But what they were doing was the same thing we were doing in many places. They were gathering intelligence. Mm -hmm. They found one right off the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Really? counting the ships that were going in and out. So they were there, mm -hmm. uh, just as they were in Cuba, Cuba later on. I stayed two years in, in the uh, North Carolina base. And again, the old economy stuff caught up and they closed the base and disbanded the squadron that I was in. Mm -hmm. And I went to Lakehurst, New Jersey, where I joined another airship squadron and was there in it for about nine months until the 1st of April, 1958. And I was again due for what they call shore duty. I spent three years out with these airships, so I was due to go ashore again. So I went back to Memphis for another tour as, instruct, as an instructor. While, there, while I was there this time, they uh, came up with a new rate in the uh, Navy, there had been men made chief, and uh, I made chief incidentally in 1955. Uh, there had been men that had made chief in, in the, uh, during the war and had never done anything since. Mm -hmm. To give people some ambition, I think more than anything else, they came up with two new rates. You could make chief, then senior chief, and then master chief. While I was in Memphis for my second tour, they uh, instituted this senior and master chief, and I made senior chief in uh, 1959, 59, 60, 1960. Okay. I spent the, uh, another three-year tour in Memphis and was transferred again. This time I was transferred to, of all places, Bermuda. Like, now, who are you? I didn't go there to enjoy the beaches. Mm -hmm. What I was there for was to continue this anti-submarine mm -hmm. stuff, but this in seaplanes, flying Martin or fl flying Martin P5 M2s. Mm -hmm. While we were there, now I would take deployments from time to time. Once I went to Trinidad, once to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba for five weeks. 
but our job was anti was anti submarine warfare. But mm -hmm. because our aircraft were long endurance, we caught the job of during the blockade of Cuba of flying looking for what they call interdiction, mm -hmm. uh, looking for German German war on war, uh, mm -hmm. Russian ships going in and out of Cuba, and intelligence work in Cuba itself. Uh, you weren't supposed to get within five miles of somebody's shoreline, but what we did was we violated the law from time to time. The intelligence people would say that we believe there's a missile site in this area, we'd fly in, do photographic work, and fly back out again. I spent uh, a little over two years in Bermuda, and they decided that these seaplanes they were flying, that we were flying, were obsolete. They were reciprocating engine aircraft, and we had got into the jet age. Mm -hmm. So, in December 1963, they sent us to Jacksonville, Florida, and gave us P-3As, which were the military version of the Lockheed Electra. And I stayed with them in Jacksonville, Florida till August of 1964, in, in which I had completed my tw 20 years in the service, and I chose to get out instead of continuing. The main reason I chose to get out was I had three children. Mm -hmm. I was the highest enlisted rank I could get, would ever be. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like, it seemed like every time my kids would get all acclimated to some place, I would come home and say, we're transferring again. Mm -hmm. So I decided to get out. I got out of the Navy, and that's, that is a picture of me on that retirement day. I'm getting my honorable discharge and being decorated on the same day. Uh, I left the Navy on a Friday, August the 14th, 1964, and Sikorsky Aircraft hired me the following Wednesday, and I spent 25 years with Sikorsky. Mm -hmm. What was your big, what was your most memorable moment in the service? Oh, I don't know. There were a lot of them, but I suppose the biggest one was when this lieutenant got killed something between me and my squad leader was probably the most horrifying moment. Mm -hmm. We we tried, we rolled him over and we found a hole in his side. And you were taught not to delay, mm -hmm. go on with your business. So we slapped a dressing on this hole, and uh, his dressing, that was another rule. You always used the man's individual dressing rather than your own. You saved yours for yourself mm -hmm. if you got in a life condition. We slapped a dressing on him, and we went looking for our platoon. When we caught up with the rest of the platoon, the assistant commander, platoon commander, wanted some maps that the commander had. And he went back to get them. And he, when he returned, he said, he's dead. Uh, well, that was probably the most horrendous, but uh, I've been under bombing attack. That wasn't wasn't a mm -hmm. day of roses. Uh, I've been shot at. 
and most of the stuff that flies, you don't know whether it's going at you or somebody else. But on one occasion, they were shooting at me and one other person and nobody else in the war. That was quite an experience. We were, we were taking wire up to the front. And where was this? Hmm? And which, um, what, where, what island was this? Okinawa. Okay. We were taking <clears throat> these reels of wire that you'd string when you had telephones, using telephones. And we liked to use telephones rather than radios because the radios of those that day were pretty unreliable. But telephones were reliable if uh, if you kept your if you didn't get it sabotaged or blown up. Mm -hmm. uh, we were taking wire up to the front, and we went down through a little railroad uh, area. They used little small single gauge railroads on Okinawa for to gather sugar cane, like they did in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. When we came up the other side, this machine gunner shot at us. There's stitches all over now. And there was a field of grass uh, of some kind in the area. And we got down in that grass and we bellied our way across the field mm -hmm. until we got into some wooded area and, and knew that we could get away with it. We never tried to hunt this machine gunner down. We didn't know where he was. Mm -hmm. He was just shooting at us. We knew it. And that's about it. Um, let's talk about your medals. Well, most of them are just... Let me see. Most of them are nothing heroic. Mm -hmm. They're just, I was there. Okay, well that's good enough. The top little device up there was uh, given to all servicemen that served honorably mm -hmm. during World War II. I don't know what they called it, but we called it the ruptured duck. Then right down below that is three ribbons. They were for things that uh, didn't get a medal. And they were normally for a large amount of people. You, if you wanted to give an award, you didn't want to give everybody a medal. So they would give them a ribbon. Unit citation. Yeah. The top one with the star in it is the combat action ribbon. I heard one time that... Uh, it took as many as 17 men behind the lines to support any one man in the lines. Mm -hmm. So that ribbon is given to people who served in the lines, mm -hmm. in the front. The star in it means I got it five times. Wow. The one with the diagonal colors over on the side is the is the presidential unit citation mm -hmm. that's given for some conspicuous operation we got it from a place called sugarloaf hill on okinawa that the americans went up this hill something like 20 times mm -hmm. before they were able to secure it the next one over is the naval unit citation uh, the star in, the, in it indicates that I got it twice. Once for the Marshall Islands and once for Guam. Mm -hmm. uh, the emblems on the side were the ones that you wore on your collar. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't wear them on your white uniform or your blue uniform. You wore them only on the khaki uniform or in aviation, we had a green uniform. You wore it on either the green uniform or... Now this is, 
if you were chief or officer, mm -hmm. the enlisted men all wore the sailor suit. Mm -hmm. Okay, the medals. The uh, far one over here is the is a com the Navy Marine Corps Commendation Medal, personal commendation. These up here were unit commendations. That was a personal commendation. The V in it means that it was for valor. Bravery or valor must be listed in the citation to be able to wear a V in it. Okay. The next one is the Good Conduct Medal, which uh, we used to say didn't necessarily mean good conduct. It just meant you didn't get caught. Mm -hmm. uh, the four stars in it means that I got it five times, the mm -hmm. ribbon plus four four editions. The next one, the yellow one, is appropriately the Chinese Chinese Service Medal for the time that we spent in North China. The next one is the Asiatic Pacific Theater of War, and the three stars in it means that for three operations, the Marshall Islands, Guam, and Okinawa. The last one over here is was given to the by the state of Connecticut, or uh, I, I don't know what the requirements were. My neighbor told me they were passing it out, and I better put my name in. Mm -hmm. Whether you had to be in combat or whether just be in the service or what, I don't know. Down on this row, the first one over there is the World War II Victory Medal. The next one is the European Occupation Ribbon. The little airplane, and it means that uh, the airlift that uh, mm -hmm. flying over the blockade. The next one was uh, given by the German government. It's called a Humane Action Ribbon. It was given for feeding the starving people of Berlin, so-called. The next one is uh, Another victory medal, one that they gave for uh, Okinawa, or not, not for Okinawa, for uh, Korea, and then rather than coin a new one for Vietnam, it's for the star, and it indicates that I got it twice, once for Korea and once for Vietnam, because I was in, I was never in Vietnam, but I was in the service. Okay. During the start of Vietnam, mm -hmm. they thought, I suppose, that my squadron was more important blockading Cuba than anything else. Mm -hmm. The last one is the Navy Expeditionary Medal, and that was given for the uh, six weeks that I spent in Cuba in mm -hmm. 1963. And that's it. So... Okay, let me t let's put that so it doesn't fall. I'm um, I wandered in to a military career. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really intended. I meant to go to that electronic school. Get an get an education. It would get me out of that those lumber camps. Mm -hmm. But I went in went in the Navy in 1947. My enlistment was up in 1951. Guess what was going on in 1951? Korea. Another damn war. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let me out. And at first, I wouldn't re-enlist. Mm -hmm. This condition lasted from May of 51, when my enlistment was up, until sometime in September. And sometime in September, I added it up, 
I had two and a half years in the Marine Corps, over four years in the Navy, and could look forward to at least another year. Hell, I'm going to have it half done before I can get out. So I went in and re-enlisted for six years. Mm -hmm. Then the die was cast. I had to say the 20. Mm -hmm. I don't regret it at all. I got married in 1952, had three marvelous children. Mm -hmm. I don't regret it at all. I don't say anybody else has to do it, mm -hmm. but it got me out of the damn lumber camps and it taught me enough electronics that Sikorsky hired me. And I, and I lasted there for 25 years. Very good. Now, during the war, um, how, did, uh, how did you communicate with your family? What's that? During the war, World War II, how did, were you able to communicate at all with your family back home? How, well, the were, you, were you able to communicate, write letters back and forth? Yeah, we wrote letters backwards and forth. A funny thing. I was on Guam in uh, 1945, uh, training for the invasion of the Japanese home islands, and so was my next younger brother. But I was in a combat outfit, and as being in a combat outfit, you couldn't tell people where you were. The Japanese could find out. You could tell where you had been, but not where you were going or where you were at. My brother was in the Navy in supply, and there was a big supply depot on Guam, and he could tell my family where he was. So he, he writes a letter home saying, I'm on Guam. My mother writes me a letter, says, Kenneth is on Guam. What the hell? I jumped in a jeep and went down and see him. There went their secrecy all to hell. Okay. Not in my particular case, mm -hmm. but that's an example of right. how, how stupid their secrecy was. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't even let us own a camera. You couldn't own a, own a camera. Mm -hmm. You might take some pictures that they didn't want you to take. Now, when I was over on the airlift and on the blockade of Cuba, you could photograph anything you wanted. Mm -hmm. But during World War II, they had a little different view. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was, what was the most tense part Tense. Tense. The invasion, Cuba. Oh, yeah. Cuba. Going in and uh, I never landed in a, a boat. Mm -hmm. They had those, what they call Higgins boats. Yes. LCVP uh, was the platoon size one. Mm -hmm. Could get 12 or 14 men in it. I never landed in one of those. What they would, I landed in amphibious tractors. And the advantage of the amphibious tractor is the, uh, they take you clear up on land mm -hmm. and you get out of the tractor. The first one that, that they used didn't have a ramp on it though and you had to bail out over the side. Uh -huh. That was a little hairy. Mm -hmm. But then after that they all had a ramp and you would They'd run you far up on, up on the beach and the rear open, not the front, the rear open, so that you come out of it not facing the front, facing opposite of the front and then went around. Uh, landing was always hairy. Uh, you didn't know what you were going to see when you got in there or what was going to happen to you. Uh, there was usually a lot of casualties on the beach because uh, you're trying to transition from either a boat or a tractor. And uh, 
these people are set up there. They, they'd make brags, I remember hearing. They'd bomb and strafe the landing area, and they would swear they killed everything in the area. Well, the Japanese were great underground people, like the Vietnamese after them. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd just go in a hole, stay there until the bombing and strafing was over, and come out. This officer that I spoke of getting killed, we were no more than 75 yards offshore, off the landing area when he got it. So they were there. Uh, snipers, some light artillery. Uh, so the, the landing was the hairiest part. Where was the, when, um you were looking for Russian subs near Cuba. What was the feeling then? Was huh? was the were the Russians going to invade at any minute, or well, was it going to be? Well, they, they... they didn't. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, higher minds than I thought of, but there were. I can swear it on a Bible. Mm -hmm. There were missiles in Cuba, mm -hmm. and they were pointed at Washington and New York, primarily. There were missiles taken out. We saw them on the deck of Russian ships, covered with canvas, but the shape was very recognizable. They took them out. There were. Russian nuclear submarines in the vicinity of uh, Cuba. Mm -hmm. We know because there's some kind of international language that if you're in the vicinity of a submarine, you can drop what they call practice step charges in a certain arrangement, which tell him that he can surface without being attacked. Mm -hmm. And one Navy squadron, not mine, but one Navy squadron forced a new, uh, Russian nuclear sub to surface. And so they knew they were there. Mm -hmm. They knew that missiles, they never saw the missiles go in because they weren't looking for them. Right. Mm -hmm. But they did see them come out, and uh, whether they all came out or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. He could still have some down there, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of a chicken game uh, that we could own a base like Guantanamo Bay, right? in the enemy's country and get away with it. Mm -hmm. They still own it. If they ever pull a Jim, Jimmy Carter and give it up like he did the Panama Canal, I'm going to be very exasperated. Mm -hmm. That base at Guantanamo Bay was given to us for freeing Cuba in the War of 1898. Mm -hmm. It's ours. We don't have to give it to anybody. So when we were when you were involved with the blockade, huh? When were you were involved with the Berlin air airlift, the Berlin airlift? Yeah. What was it that you were doing there again? Well, we were flying over because the Russians blockaded Berlin, mm -hmm. and they um, cut off all road traffic, canal traffic, and air traffic, uh, civilian air traffic. Yes. And Berlin is inside of uh, East Germany. inside of the Russian zone, right? East Germany of Germany, and uh, they don't produce any food or coal or anything in Berlin, so it had to be brought into them. So you were based in West Germany then? Yes, I was based in at Rhine Main, 
which is right outside of Frankfurt, mm -hmm. Germany. And our purpose was to, fall, was to carry supplies to keep people alive. We didn't carry any military material, mm -hmm. only stuff to keep people alive. Primarily, my squadron carried coal. Mm -hmm. uh, now, coal, if you had it like you do in a railroad car, shifting around would have crashed the aircraft because it would have changed the center of gravity. Mm -hmm. They put it into bags. Okay. Uh, first, a lot of they got a lot of army type sea bags somewhere, and they'd fill the sea bags up full of coal, or as I suppose you would call them, duffel bags. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd fly them in, dump them, and if they had some empties, we would bring them back to the American zone with us. Later on, I think their duffel bags worn out, and so they used these paper bags like you'd get a uh, bag of potatoes mm -hmm. in. Uh, an amusing thing about carrying that type of stuff. This one officer one day got in his airplane, took off from Frankfurt, headed for Berlin, and the airplane felt awful sluggish. And anything he did wouldn't improve it any. He got to Frankfurt, Germany, and just out of curiosity, he had him count the amount of bags of coal he had. And what he had was we were supposed to fly 10 ton each flight. He had 15 ton of wow. coal. And the way it had, had happened was they used these big semi trucks would come out as soon as the aircraft landed, they'd be backed up to it, loading the next load, mm -hmm. providing the aircraft was flyable. It might be non-flyable because of something wrong with it, mm -hmm. but they'd be loading the next load of, of uh, coal aboard it. They assumed that uh, the aircraft that was loading him at first didn't have a full load. So it sent back for another one, wow. and he ended up putting two loads aboard instead wow. of one. Uh, another strange thing had happened, uh, and this was on an Air, Air Force a aircraft. This aircraft lost an engine over the Russian area, and the inboard engine on the right-hand side and when the engine went bad, it started vibrating through its prop, which went out and killed the outboard engine on that side and took about 18 inches of the end of the wing. So they were going to crash. That's all I was to it, unless they could get rid of this 10 ton of coal. This, there was one man that we flew across the airlift with a pilot, a co-pilot, and a loadmaster. That was all that was on the aircraft <laughs> because you could use up the space that a full crew used mm -hmm. in more coal. The loadmaster is by himself. He's got 10 ton of coal in paper bags and an open hatch some way. And he could never explain how. He threw that 10 ton of coal out through the escape hatch and they flew back. Wow. And made it. And he couldn't explain it. Mm -hmm. But he got, a, he got a medal for it. There you go. Now, how has your service influenced your life after the service? What? How did your experiences and your 20 years in the military influence the rest of your life? Well, first of all, I said my military training got me a job at Sikorsky five days after I got out, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, it gave me a, it gave me a, a skill that I could capitalize on. Mm -hmm. I started out at, now the thing that got me into Sikorsky was Sikorsky at a training school. Because if you pay $10 million for an aircraft, you want somebody to tell you how it works. Mm -hmm. So they had a training school. I uh, came in as an, as an instructor, instructing company or instructing military personnel not how to fly. They were already pilots or trained mechanics or electronic people or whatever they may be. But what was the difference between this new Sikorsky aircraft you're going to get? and what you've been flying previously mm -hmm. was my job. I stayed at that for three years, and I got moved to management. And I was in management about three years. I was in charge of all training devices that the company built. Uh, the customer always wants training devices so he can teach in, the hot, in, a, in a classroom instead of tying up an aircraft for instructional purposes. I was in charge of all training devices that Sikorsky made for about three years. And one of these, the bad part about working for a company like Sikorsky is they're tied to the budget, the country's budget. Mm -hmm. If if there's a war going on, nobody gets laid off. Mm -hmm. If there's peace going on, they start laying people off. So uh, I got in a vulnerable position, and I had some favors due, and I asked, from to be paid up, mm -hmm. and I moved from this instructional job to engineering as a, uh, what they call an engineering aide. This is a man who does virtually everything the engineer does, but he doesn't have a degree, mm -hmm. and so he's paid less money. I, while this was going on, I was going to college at night in 1978, I graduated from college, and they immediately made me an electrical engineer. Mm -hmm. And I uh, left Sikorsky in 1990 as a uh, senior electrical engineer. And it all traces back to the, to the military, because that's where I learned what an ohm and a volt and a 